morning, everyone. Morning. Welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus as we gather to worship the living God. By way of announcement, a few things to mention just this afternoon, the choir practice at three o'clock this afternoon, and new members welcome to the, the, the three o'clock this afternoon. Um, tomorrow evening, the Elders Fellowship for the Presbytery for Root Presbyteries over in Dermaria, and speaker there from CE. Uh, it's 8 o'clock tomorrow evening. Tuesday, the, the monthly friendship group over in Ramon at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Wednesday, um, the midweek meeting at 8 in the minor hall for Bible study and prayer. And that's open to all. Then Friday evening, the Pit Boys Brigade display. What time is that at? Half seven. Half seven. That's good. Just wasn't sure. I hadn't it in the diary properly, so half seven. Uh, and then Saturday, the... the what youth fellowship of the trip to Belfast Giants has arranged or booked for those that have booked into that. Next Sunday evening, 7 p.m., the Mission in Ireland service in Dunloy Presbyterian, Keith Preston from the uh, Irish Mission and working with, with migrants or mostly migrants in Belfast now this last number of years, the International Meeting Point, South Belfast and West Belfast, and a great work going on uh, among migrants and many turning to the Lord Jesus and calling upon him, people coming from different nations and God at work. And so Keith will be speaking about about that and uh, Gary McDowell from Greystones in the Republic will be there as well. That's the 17th of March, next Sunday evening at 7 in Dunloy. It's a presbytery service. And then Sunday the 24th, the Youth Fellowship. The Good Friday service, a joint service with Ramon, and this year it'll be over in Ramon Hall on, on the 29th, Good Friday at 8 p.m. And we'll get more details about that in due course. And then just a reminder, the, the gifts or the things that you might want to bring to send to Uganda that Sarah, Sarah Kane mentioned last week, there's still opportunity to bring that next week and to leave them uh, in the porch uh, for that, so bear that in mind. And if you want to give an offering to Fields of Life Mission, just put that in an envelope either today or next Sunday uh, for Fields uh, of Life uh, or Uganda and if you have a, a, a WFO number just put that on it and it can be gifted, it can be sent on as well. Um, so we support the, the mission that Sarah's going with through that offering. And if anyone's thinking of membership, uh, come into communicant membership if you let me know and we'll seek to, 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 to get something arranged in regard to that. So anyone thinking of communicant membership or membership classes, let me know as soon as possible, please. Our call to worship comes from, from Matthew 22. And Jesus, in answer to questions, said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first, this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Love for God and love for others. That sums up all the law and the prophets. And only by God's grace can we love him and one another. Only as God puts his love in our hearts. And we pray as we gather here this day that he will do just that. That he'll fill our, love, fill our hearts with his love. We're going to sing two hymns at the start of our service. Shine Jesus, shine then. Help us to help each other, Lord. Let us worship God. We'll stand to sing.
Let's come to God in prayer. Let us unite our hearts. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we bow in your presence, thankful for the fellowship of your people that we can strengthen one another, care for one another, and spur one another on as you desire us to do, helping one another to walk close with you and to grow in your grace and to fulfill the calling that you have upon us to be your people in a needy world. Thank you, O God, that you shine your light and that light of yours is shining bright in the, in the gospel of our Lord Jesus, the one who is the light of the world. And we're amazed, Lord, that as we put our trust in you, you describe us as the light of the world, for the light of Jesus is to shine through us. And what a calling you have given us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to let that light shine this day by the way we live and talk and think. Forgive us, Lord, when very often by the way we live and talk and think we're hiding that light under a bushel, under a basket. Lord, for, forgive us when we bring no glory to your name, rather when we bring dishonor to your name. Enable us, Lord, to care for one another, to love one another. Put that love in our hearts, we pray, in your mercy, that those maybe that we find difficult to love, we will grow to love more and more. And when we make ourselves difficult to love, Lord, help us to repent of our foolishness and to welcome the love of others into our lives, those that want to care for us and help us and to and to spur us on in the faith. Thank you, O God, that you place us in families. And where we have known love and stability in our families, Lord, we give you thanks and praise. And if we have not known that love and stability, we thank you, O Lord, that you grant us your grace sufficient for each day and night. And you bring us into your family. And Lord, what a wonder it is to be part of the royal family of God able to call your heavenly father dear father where we have known earthly mothers who have cared for us and loved us we thank you lord for some lord that's looking back and remembering with thankfulness for they're no longer in the scene of time and we pray your ongoing comfort for all those who mourn and miss their loved ones father we thank you for those that have pointed it onto, onto, pointed us onto jesus who from our earliest days brought us up in the faith, telling us the good news of the gospel and showing us living, living out that good news before us, teaching us your word, teaching us how to pray, praying with us and feeding us with the word of life. And Lord, where we have been set in godly homes, how blessed we are. And Lord, we pray for our mothers seeking to bring up children in the present day, that you will grant them your help and your encouragement and your wisdom and your grace and the energy they need for each day and night. For mothers bringing up little ones alone, Lord, with lack, lack of support of others, Lord, grant them great encouragement and help. Grant them the strength of your spirit and grant them that joy of seeing little ones come to know Christ early in life. Lord, we need you. And our homes need you as individuals, we need you, and our households need you, and we feel our brokenness and the pain of it and the way it affects us as families and as communities and as nations. And we see the horrible things we're capable of doing one to another, even horrible things we say and do to those we say we love. Forgive us our many sins, Lord. Lord, we think of Mothers, some who have wandered far from you and wandered far from their loved ones and, Lord, turn their hearts back, we pray, to your mercy. Have mercy upon them and grant that they might realise that there is forgiveness with you, that there is salvation full and free. Lord, move by your Spirit in our lives this day. Transform us, we pray. We thank you, O God, that your love is like that of a mother and a father all wrapped up in one. And you speak of that great love as, as a mother hen would gather chicks under its wings so you would have us run to you and to rest in you. And Lord, may we know the security of your love and what it is to 
Snuggle up as a little chick would snuggle under the feathered wing. So may we run to your arms of love. To know what it is to be hidden under the shadow of your wing. To be secure and safe and cared for by the love of Almighty God. And so Lord, we pray that each head bowed here this day would come to know the wonder of that reality. The reality of your love and your salvation. The reality of rejoicing in you and making you known. O oh Lord, grant new birth, grant new life in Christ. And where there is new birth, Lord, lead us on with yourself, that we may give evidence that you are sufficient for us, that you are our portion and our joy and our delight, and that our joy flows from you. Lord, feed us with your word, and guide us in your truth, and forgive us our many sins, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're reading from Daniel chapter 1, first of all, and then from 1 Corinthians 8. If you find the prophet Ezekiel, the next book is Daniel. Ezekiel is one of those larger sections in our Old Testament, Ezekiel, and then you'll come to Daniel. And we read Daniel chapter 1. Imagine many of you know something of the story of Daniel and his friends taken from Jerusalem and from their homeland and their security of family and friends around them and taken to Babylon and to the capital of the Babylonian Empire. And they were but young lads. Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1, let us hear God's word. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar and to the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. And then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, used without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach him the literature and language of the Chaldeans, or Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate, and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. And among these were Daniel, Hananiah, and Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them, them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would, so you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of ten days it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. And then turning to 1 Corinthians 8. Verse 7 to the, to the end of the chapter, we'll read from verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. And Paul the Apostle wrote, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, 
from whom all things, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And in that very verse and statement, Paul is declaring Jesus to be God, to be one with the Father. That's a, that's a, a verse packed full of doctrine. One Lord Jesus Christ. The title Lord, the Old Testament scriptures used for God is given now to the Lord Jesus. One Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. So all things are through Christ and through whom we exist. We exist through Jesus. He is God and man. One person, two natures. Verse 7, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defined. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged or emboldened if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and sisters and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Amen, and we thank God for these readings from his holy word. If the girls and boys come to the front for a few moments, please. Good morning, and good to see you. And thanks for coming forward. We are reading in the Old Testament Bible reading about a young man, and he was what a young lad, and his name is Daniel. You know the story of Daniel, I'm sure some of you, you've read about Daniel. And Daniel, at the time he lived, things in Jerusalem and Israel were bad. And for the people of Israel, things were really bad. And the neighboring king of Babylon called Nebuchadnezzar, I don't think anybody has that name today. That's some name, isn't it? Nebuchadnezzar, I don't, I'm probably not pronouncing it right. But Nebuchadnezzar was a mighty king. God had allowed this man to, to grow his empire and become strong. And God had allowed him to come and overrun Israel because Israel had sinned against God. And, and so now we see that people were being taken captive and, and these Babylonians were taking some of the treasured possessions out of the temple in Jerusalem. They're, they were taking things out, some of the things that were used in the worship of the living God. They had ransacked the place. They were taking the things of gold, the precious things. And they also took a whole lot of the people. It didn't take all the people. The next slide shows you people being led off and chained and enslaved from Jerusalem. And they're going to be led all the way to Babylon. Long journey. Maybe modern day Iraq. Thinking of, of that region. And from Jerusalem to Babylon, they traveled and they walked. And Daniel was one of them. He was one of those traveling all that way. Daniel and his three friends that we'll read about. And the Babylonian Empire at that time was, was very grand. The buildings were great. And, and this, this capital city of Babylon of, and the Empire of Babylonia, it was some city. And the people thought it wonderful. The people of Babylon it is. But Daniel and his friends didn't really want to be there. They were wanting to be back home with their friends, with their family. And there was Daniel... And three friends that were named, these four young men, were picked out among others because the king had these servants picking out people that they thought would be able to, to think and learn and study and serve the king really well. And he looked at these four young men and thought they looked like they might just be the right material. Young men easily, easily changed and molded and taught and trained to be the people I want them to be. But little did the king know the nature of these men. And so these four men were picked out as special. They were going to be given like a, a degree education, a three-year teaching program and training program and language and literature and all the teachings of Babylon so they'd be able to speak the, the languages of the place. They'd be able to, to know what to do in Babylon and be able to serve the king as servants of the king of Babylon. 
And as part of that, not only were they going to be taught all these things, but they were going to be given food from the king's table and wine from the king's table. And these were but young lads, and the thought of wine for many a young lad freely flown from a royal table would have appealed. And the thought of all the good food and the wonderful meat and all coming from the king's table, whatever the king was getting, they would get. That'd be, many a young lad would have thought that great. But you know what Daniel said? He said to the servant of the king, I'm not going to eat that because it's been offered to idols and I cannot eat that. I'll be sinning against my God and that wine, again, that'll have me sinning against God. I'm not going to drink it. Just give me vegetables and water. Imagine the shock in the faces of your parents today if you went home and said, just give me vegetables and water and I'll be okay. But these young men didn't want to sin against God. And so they weren't going to eat this food because it was offered to idols and they weren't going to sin against God because they knew to take it would have them sinning against God. But the, the king's servant said, but if I don't get you to eat this good food and drink this wine, then I might lose my head. Literally, the king might have me killed because I'm not doing what he told me to do and you, you'll not be looking too well. And Daniel trusted God. He said, try us for 10 days and see what happens. Just give us vegetables and water. Myself and my three friends, just try us for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, what did we read? They looked far healthier and even fatter. They looked better, stronger than all the others around about them. And so the king's servant said, it's okay. I'll do as you say. And I'll just give you the vegetables and the water and I'll not make you eat this royal food. And so that's what they did those years. They didn't want to sin against God. They didn't want to defile themselves, the Bible says. They didn't want to sin against God. And God blessed them. And God was going to use them mightily, even in the salvation of others. Girls and boys, it's a great thing to know the Lord and to trust him, even when we don't understand all that's going on around about us, to trust the Lord as Daniel did. He was but a young lad, and he trusted God. And God was able to make vegetables and water enough for Daniel and his friends to thrive on. And when we trust God and walk God's ways, we'll thrive. When we walk with God, when we trust him, we don't go with the flow of the world, but we walk with God. He'll make us flourish. He'll grant blessing upon our lives and he'll use us for his glory. And Daniel was happy in the Lord. And may it be that God raises up young people, women and men out of this place who delight in him and who know that the things of the world don't satisfy, but God satisfies. And he's still raising up women and men just like that who live for him, who find their joy in him. You know the secret for Daniel? He knew the Lord. He knew the joy of the Lord. And he loved to serve him. And when you and I, when we know the Lord, and grown-ups, when we know the Lord, we know his joy, and he is enough for us. He's sufficient to grant us contentment in life. We're going to sing the Lord's praise, Saviour, teach me day by day.
just a reminder over the, uh, the today and next Sunday, the, the envelopes with Uganda and uh, your WFO number, if you have one on that, uh, and the amount, and, and that will go to Fields of Life mission uh, that Sarah is linked with as she goes out to Uganda. And the reminder to bring the other things, the practical things that were listed, there's a little list at both porch doors as to the things, the materials to bring uh, for the schools out there as well. We continue to worship God as we bring our tithes and offerings. Thank you to Audrey and the choir. Let's come to God with our prayers of intercession as we think of the needs of others. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your amazing grace and that we can know and be assured that we're forgiven, that we're saved by your grace and that you will keep us. And Lord, we don't know the day or the time of our Lord Jesus has returned, but dear Father, we thank you we're secure in that knowledge that when he comes in glory, all will be well with our souls, for all is well when we're trusting in Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the salvation of our souls and for that promised redemption of our bodies. Well, we thank you, Lord, that there is a glory land to come, a world to come where there'll be no sickness or pain or death, no sorrow, no sin. We thank you, Lord, that you're going to remake all things. 
and that your redeemed will dwell with you in the resurrection bodies on that new heavens, new earth, the home of righteousness, and you dwell in the midst of your people. Lord, may we consider our present sufferings as light and momentary as Paul did in the light of eternity and the weight of glory that is ours. Lord, help us to look forward with eager expectation, longing for the coming of our King. And Father, as we bow in your presence, we intercede for a needy world. There are people who are trying to find their fulfillment in the here and now and in the fleeting pleasures of sin. And Father, we know with those things don't satisfy for we've tried them. And there may be a, a fleeting and momentary thrill, but Lord, they bring regret and shame and slavery. And you bring life in all its fullness. And you set the captives free. And Father, as we bow in your presence this day, we pray for the move of your spirit in the nations of the world. We think of the situation in Gaza and in Israel and we pray, O oh God, your mercy. Help those that seek to bring aid to the needy. Grant that they might safely get there and it might be distributed in a way that's for the good of all. And we pray, Lord, just help those who are seeking to manage that food aid and other practical aid coming in. We pray, Lord, for help and for, for the cooperation of all concerned for the good of people, Lord. We just pray, Lord, your, your, your safekeeping and those that seek to organise that and those that distribute it. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we pray that you will bring that war to an end, that there will be some sort of settlement or resolution even beyond our asking, Lord, we pray answer. And Father, we pray too for Ukraine and the situation there. And we pray that those bent on hostility and, and aggression would retreat. And we pray, Lord, for a just settlement there, for peace to be established. And we thank you that the gospel's spreading in the midst of all these war zones, that there is good news spreading. And people are putting their trust in the Lord Jesus. We think of Myanmar or Burma as we used to call it and the turmoil there over these past years. And we pray for your church there and the persecution it faces. Continue to grant them your help and your provision and your boldness. And continue to enable them to see their neighbours and their friends and family members reached with the gospel. Lord, may your church flourish and continue to flourish in Myanmar. And we pray too that the, the horror of war there will be brought to an end. We think of North Korea and the brutality of that regime and yet your church is there and people are trusting you and, and proclaiming you in spite of all the opposition, in spite of all the risks. And Lord, may that underground church continue to flourish to the praise of your glorious name. Lord, we see so much hatred and bitterness throughout the world, the reality of it within all our hearts, that old sinful nature, just as Cain killed his brother Abel, Lord, so we are each one capable of horrible things. That old nature, Lord, help us to put it to death daily and to live in the Spirit, to walk in the newness of life that is in Christ. And give us a love one for another and a care for one another and for the good of others and the glory of your name. And Father, as we look around the world, we see evidence of sin abounding in so many places. And yet, Lord, we thank you that your grace is also abounding and that there are those seeing their need of sins forgiven and running to Jesus by faith. We think of the situation in Nigeria, Lord. We hear yet again of Children, young people being taken captive, all these girls taken captive and enslaved. And Father, that grieves our hearts and how their families must grieve. And Lord, we pray that you would grant the government of Nigeria a resolve and a will to deal with these issues and the people that carry out these atrocities. Grant the government and army a resolve to, to bring justice and to establish a rule of law and not just to tolerate and allow these things to happen. Father, we pray for your mercy. We 
Pray, Lord, for those who are bent on carrying out these things, Lord, in the wickedness of their hearts. We pray, Lord, grant that they would see, Lord, just how horrible are the crimes they carry out. Lord, turn their hearts away from these things, Lord, in your mercy. Bring the light of the gospel into those regions, Lord, regions where there is great opposition to the gospel. And so we pray for Nigeria, Lord, parts of it where the light of the gospel of Christ shines and parts where it don't. And we pray, Lord, that that light will spread throughout the whole nation and for all the people of that great nation. Lord, have mercy. And may your church flourish and bring a wholeness to life and a treating of men and women with equality and with dignity. And Lord, we pray for those young people that have been taken captive. Lord, help them and help them to look to you and to call upon you and to find their strength and their peace in you, even as you enabled Daniel and his friends in the midst of captivity and slavery and Babylon to find peace and a purpose to live. Lord, grant these young lives hope in the midst of their situation. Grant that they will be able to return to their families, their loved ones. Protect them, we pray, and grant them hope this day in all that they go through. Father, we pray for our own nation here, and we pray, Lord, for wisdom for those who govern us, that they'll be able to use all the resources at their disposal wisely and efficiently. And grant, Lord, help for a civil servants who seek to advise those politicians and what to do. Lord, raise up people with a a mind and a heart to, to do what's best for a whole province and a whole nation, Lord. Raise up people with that ability and that, that calling upon their lives to seek to, to bring blessing upon a nation. And raise up preachers of your word, Father, pastors and teachers and evangelists and servants for the mission field. Put a burden on hearts this day to serve you, the living God. Lord, we bring to you loved ones who are struggling with frailty of body, mind, or soul, those that are hurting and grieving, those awaiting appointments, and those going through treatment. Lord, you know the whole range, Lord. You know better than they know themselves. And we name them to you today, those at home or in hospital or in care. Lord, may the touch of your hand be upon them, and may they know the peace of God that passeth all understanding. And give skill and enabling to those that tend to them and treat them, Lord. Guide them in the decisions they make. And grant that your peace would rule and reign in all our hearts and in our loved ones' hearts. And we'll be able to trust you with every providence that comes our way. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. As we return to 1 Corinthians 8... And a passage that is answering the question that had come from Corinth to Paul. Remember Paul had been there when the church was founded, Acts 18. He spent 18 months at least there in Corinth at one point when he, he feared and he feared the persecution that might come and, and the hardships. He had already been battered and bruised physically, literally many a time and, and feared what would come. And, and he was reassured in Corinth that God had many people in this great city, that there were many who were going to be saved in Corinth. God had called them and would draw them to himself through faith in Jesus. And so the gospel went forth and the church grew in Corinth. And then Paul needed to move on elsewhere with the, the gospel and teaching ministry that he had. And, and leaders were there and, and in place, young leaders, spiritually speaking. And they're still in need of, of much guidance. And so they, they're writing, the church is writing to Paul, the apostle. And it's good at least that they knew they should seek the apostles counsel for there were others rising up who thought they knew more than the apostles knew thought they were super spiritual and had far more light than than even the apostles that god had appointed and so they're writing and one of the questions they ask is now concerning food offered to idols what are we to do and you're thinking to yourself now that's not so relevant for me here in this wee province in the 21st century it's still relevant it's very relevant for the principles that flow out of all of this are very relevant. The principles of love for brothers and sisters in Christ. Last week we looked at the opening verses of the chapter and love for the Lord our God. That we are to worship the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. There is but one true and living God and we're to worship him 
and verse 6 there is one God the Father from whom are all things all things are from him and for whom we exist we exist for the God for the Father's glory and there's one Lord Jesus Christ these two statements are saying the same sort of thing the same thing being said about Jesus is said about God God the Father and so one Lord Jesus Christ through him so if, if all things are from the Father, if all things are come through the Son, through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. We exist through our Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him. He is God in the flesh, truly God and truly man, our precious Lord. And we are to worship God and that's the, the focus of all things as we deal with the questions and the difficulties of life the paramount focus is the worship of the living God, to worship and adore God and to find our joy and our purpose in him, for there's none other God. Knowledge, some knowledge puffs people up full of pride. Paul says, some of these Corinthians were writing that we all have knowledge and we all know what to do. We don't, we don't need others to tell us, but some knowledge puffs people up full of pride, but love builds up. And so a knowledge of the gospel brings love. And people are built up in the faith. We, we're built up ourselves in the love of Christ and we build others up in the love of Christ. And so now, now the, the focus moves from loving God to loving our brothers and sisters in Jesus. In answer to that question about food sacrifice to idols, you may think you've never had food sacrifice to idols, but I dare say many of you have. Not just when you travelled abroad and your travels and you, you didn't know where that meat came from or what had happened to it before it got the length of your table. And the context here is not just a, by, buying food from a butcher's and bringing it back home to cook it. It's the context of the venue and the menu. There the, were eating places in Corinth attached to the pagan gods and temples that there were many of. And we, we talked about that in the early chapters in, in Corinth. That there were many different religions, many false gods worshipped there, many different temples in Corinth. Uh, and these eating places is a part of that surrounding that, that worship that pagan worship and so people being invited along just imagine many of these Corinthian Christians were converted out of that background so their family members are still going to these pagan places and having meals there and saying we want you to come with us it's, it's, it's the family pressure thing that is always upon us well you know quite a long time ago now I suppose I worked in a, in a meat plant in Oma and part of their contracts at that time, one of the contracts they had secured at that time was supplying meat to Egypt, a long way away. But for Egypt to take that meat, it needed to be regularly slaughtered. It wasn't acceptable the way we would slaughter the meat normally. It needed to be regularly slaughtered and not trusting the, the people that worked in the meat plant too well, these Egyptians said, if we're going to buy meat of you, all the meat that is slaughtered in that meat plant must be ritually slaughtered. And that's what happened. And those contracts were there. Every animal that came through, a prayer was said over it by a man who'd been sent over and a, a knife that he came with. And I tell you, he knew his job very well. None of those animals ever got back up off the floor again, I can assure you, in contrast to the the, the system we might have used in the stun gun. And that man knew how to carry out his job efficiently and effectively, but he was saying a prayer over every animal that was slaughtered. That food was sacrificed to idols. A prayer to Allah, who is not the true and living God. And so, if you were around at that time, you would have been purchasing food, meat, prayed over in that way, and unwittingly to you, you were eating it. But if you go to other lands, you may well be unwittingly eating food sacrificed to idols. And there were those in Corinth who were saying, well, it doesn't matter because these idols are false gods. There is but one true and living God. And, and Paul says, absolutely. In regard to God, there is none other. In comparison with God, all these other gods are false and non-entities. But in regards to people, these false gods, these idols have a grip. And Paul makes the distinction here very clearly. Oh, absolutely, there's only one true and living God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that's 
how he has revealed himself from all eternity. That's who he is from all eternity. God does not change. Even in Genesis 1 in the Old Testament, we see it implicitly there, what is explicit in the New Testament. So God the Father spoke in the Word, and we discover in John 1, the Word is the Son of God. The Word went forth, and God made all things through his Word, and the Spirit of God was hovering over it all and bringing order. And there in Genesis 1, you have the triune God. It's implicit there. What will be made explicit, there is progressive revelation throughout the, the Old Testament scriptures as we come to the fullness of it all in Christ. And the worship of God, we are to worship the one true God, the living God, and we worship him in and through our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Worshipping Father, Son and Holy Spirit and loving these Two great commandments that sum up all the commandments. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. To love neighbour as ourselves. Sum up the law and the prophets. And how we need the help of Almighty God to enable us. To enable us. To love. And so this reality of, of what was asked here in regard to idols. It's still a, a real issue for us. Not just in regard to what we eat. But in regard to other questions that we deal with matters of debate among Christians and how we interact with them, whether or not we care for the conscience of another Christian or not. How much do we care for others is at the heart of the passage and to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. How do we see ourselves is the first question as we think of all of this. Do we see ourselves as super spiritual Christians who have more light than others and, and maybe think, we know better than the apostles and we know better than others and we know those idols are nothing therefore we'll go to those places and we'll partake of those meals and it won't trouble us. And maybe you think it won't trouble you, maybe you're able to do that but it may well be troubling some person that you think has a weaker conscience, a weaker brother or sister in Christ who for them to go to that place having been brought up in that pagan worship and to go back there now as a Christian they're, they're, they're in between, they're worshipping both the idol in their mind and they're worshipping the Lord Jesus and, and trying to do both and it's a syncretistic thing and they know it's not good for their souls and you go in with your freedom to the place where you know you're not worshipping the idol and them seeing you going and going with you and they are worshipping the idol being drawn back into the worship of the idol and so we're to have a concern for brothers and sisters in Christ who may, may describe as the weaker brother and incidentally, the way Paul speaks of the strong and the weak here, I'm inclined to think the weaker brother is the stronger or more spiritual of the two. Uh, and as he goes on through these, these chapters and comes back to this issue of food sacrificed to idols, he makes it explicitly clear that the Christians in Corinth or anywhere else should not partake of this or should not go to these places where this, these, these gatherings are happening in the food sacrificed to idols. He makes it clear don't go there because while the idol is nothing behind every idol lies the demonic the powers of darkness that's in chapter 10 so while these idols are false non-entities behind them why do idols grip the hearts of men and women and children because behind them are the powers of darkness and that's coming from Deuteronomy and 1 Corinthians 10 and we'll look at it in more detail another day but this reality of how we see ourselves, beware setting our rights above our responsibilities, in other words. Speaking of our freedoms and not thinking of our responsibilities to fellow Christians, beware setting our rights and our freedoms above our responsibilities. That's what he's pointing us to here. Then secondly, how do we see fellow Christians? How do you think of those who profess to be Christ? And there's some here today you struggle to get on with and some out in other churches you struggle to get on with. No doubt there are, for we are all different personalities and, and with different issues and backgrounds and, and little things and Nicholas and neither you nor these other Christians you're thinking about at the minute. None of us are perfect and so we irritate one another at times and the closer we get to one another, the more likely we are to irritate one another. And so how do you see fellow Christians? brothers and sisters in Christ. 
Do you see them just as other people to keep at a distance and not to get too close to? Or do you see them as someone for whom Christ died? And when you think of those that you might call weaker because of the decisions they make, do you see them as, as just getting in your way and holding you back because they're weaker of conscience? Or do you see them as someone for whom Christ died? Verse 9 says, Take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged or emboldened if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. The brother for whom Christ died. Beware you could destroy our brother or sister in Christ. I don't believe that means eternal destruction, but it is spiritually destroying them. Instead of helping weak Christians, and we're all weak, instead of helping other Christians to grow, to grow up in the Lord and to go on with the Lord, we're actually crippling them. We're leading other Christians into things that, against, that goes against their conscience. They have no peace about doing, but because they see us doing it, they think, ah, oh, I'll just do that too. And, and they're going against their conscience. And read Romans 14. Christian, when you go against your conscience, even though the thing may not be, be clear biblical, that, biblically that it's a sin to do, and you go against your conscience because you think it's a sin to do, you have sinned against God. So be careful of coercing the weaker brother or sister into doing things that their conscience tells them they shouldn't do because you're, you're coercing them into sin. So care for them. Care for the weaker brother or sister in Christ. Care for them. Don't put a stumbling block in their way that will trip them up and ruin them. How we see ourselves, how we see our fellow Christians, how we see Jesus is at the very heart of it. For verse 12 says, Thus sinning against your brothers and sisters and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. When we sin against brothers and sisters in Christ, we sin against Christ. Isn't that amazing? Paul knew all about this. What did the Lord Jesus say to him on the Damascus Road as he was journeying to Damascus with letters of approval to destroy Christians there? And the brightness of the light of the risen Lord Jesus shone and Saul of Tarsus as he was then was overwhelmed and fell to the ground. And, and Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me, Jesus said. Saul was persecuting Christians, but in so doing he was persecuting Christ. And Christian, when we have no regard for fellow Christians and their conscience and we seek to push them around or coerce or cause them to stumble, we are sinning against Christ. Such is the union of Christ with his people. And how we see Jesus governs the way we live, the way we think, and the way we treat others. And so that person maybe you're struggling with and you're, you don't really have any affinity with and, and, and you just think I'll just keep them at a distance and get on with my life that professing Christian that you're just not sure how to deal with, you start to look at them in a different light. Instead of looking at someone who's just hard to get on with for you, and they're maybe thinking the same about, about you here, but hard to get on with. Instead of looking at them in that light, look at them and say, here is a brother or sister for whom Christ died. A brother or sister for whom Christ died. That's how Paul describes it here at the end of verse 11. The brother or sister for whom Christ died. For we're often thinking of Christ dying for us, but looking at others and saying, Christ died for them. It affects the way we think of them. It will affect it greatly. It will affect the way you treat them, the way you pray for them. Christ died for that brother or sister. Christ loves them. And he loves me and he died for me and so I am to love with the love of Christ. Loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so as we apply the principles that are here, it is the principle of, of not coercing the conscience of a weaker Christian and not causing a, a Christian to stumble or to fall. It's, it's being careful of what we do, not just in regard to, 
to, to food, sacrifice to idols, but in regard to a whole number of matters. As you try to live out your life for Christ, you apply these principles to everyday things. And so in regard to, to things that Daniel and his friends dealt with, they weren't going to eat the food offered to idols, the meat from the royal table, they weren't going to drink the wine, they were, they were seeking to walk with their Lord and their God, for they knew the joy of the Lord. They knew the Lord, the living God, and his great salvation. And so for me, in regard to the attitude toward alcohol and, and Christians of all sorts of attitudes toward it. And certainly the Bible speaks of wine in moderation and, and, and all of that. And you may be able to deal with it in moderation and you may be content in your conscience that that's okay for you. And the Bible also speaks of alcohol making a mockery of people and the dangers of it. And you only need to go back to Noah and Genesis and see what happened to Noah. And there are all sorts of warnings there. And I've seen enough warnings in my life outside of the Bible and in the Bible. A dear man I grew up with working in a farm at home. And alcohol took his farm away. Had to be sold because of a drink problem. He had plenty of friends when he was buying them rounds of drink, but when his money was done, the friends were gone. A man's life ruined. A dear man who was full of kindness, ruined with alcohol. And I thank God that man was saved out of the midst of all of that. Called upon the Lord. He had to serve time for a while because of the abuse he gave and the driving offences, the abuse he gave to police and the driving offences. He had to serve time. But God drew near and saved him. Now, I might think I'm strong and drink will never grip me like that, but I know I'm not that strong. I don't trust myself that much. And I don't need the alcohol. I don't need it. I'd rather have water. And I'm aware of the influence I might have on others if I'm standing out somewhere with the drink in front of me and young people or older people say, well, the minister thinks it's all right, therefore it must be all right and they'll just indulge and get on with it. The influence on a weaker brother's conscience may be our freedom to do something, but for the love of others, I might choose not to do something. And you need to make your choices for the love of others. Daniel and his friends flourished without the wine from the king's table. And I can assure you, he'll flourish without it too. Timothy advised to take a little for his stomach's sake. I don't think there's many take it for that reason in the present here and now. In my young days as a Christian, out with friends that, that weren't Christians and going to the places they would go to and, and trying to get alongside them and to, and to witness to them. And I discovered after a while, I was in the wrong place because they weren't wanting me to witness to them. They were wanting to go out and get blocked out of their minds. And, and for them, for many of them, their idea of a good night out was if they couldn't remember it the next day. And that wasn't for me as a Christian, nor is it ought it to be for any Christian. And so there are times where we don't go where others go and we don't do what others do. And we might stand out as different, and you might not want to stand out as different, but Christ wants you to stand out as different in the right way, for his glory. And so for the sake of weaker brothers, be careful what you do. Be careful the example you set. Lest we be a stumbling block to others. Or you could take these principles and apply them to the things we watch and listen to, and the stuff that floods in through our eye gate and ear gate and affects our souls. And the amount of rubbish that, that's just freely available and accessible and frighteningly accessible to, to even to little children, if you're not careful, the amount of rubbish that's vile and destroys us. And all these so-called reality shows and, and people just can't wait for the next ex episode and the next fix of it all and it's, and it's ruining lives. It's distorting the way we think of people and treat people and, and distorting our understanding of healthy relationships and, and we do well to think about others who we talk to about all of this maybe in, in our workplace or our college as we, we interact in our conversations about it all and, and it's as if we're just loving all that stuff the same way they do and it would be far healthier to be able to say I, I don't find that stuff doing my soul any good and I don't think it's healthy for anybody and just 
And they may say, oh, you, you, you're st st starting to preach now, are you? And they may not like it, but you just you can remove yourself from conversations around the, the, the vile things that people get engrossed in. For the sake of weaker brothers or sisters, be careful of what we indulge in, lest they indulge in it. Maybe you're able to indulge in it and your, your soul's not sinning, and that would be a surprise. But maybe you think you can. That's what Paul's saying. Maybe you think you can. You're strong enough. But don't coerce others down that route and don't be a stumbling block to others because for most people, those things will ruin their souls. And is it any wonder we have no appetite or no concentration for the word when our minds and our hearts are gripped by other things? Or in regard to the Lord's day and how we treat it, a precious day. And I'll bring up in the next slide just as we come to this one. And, and, and in all these things, in these principles of living out your life with love for brothers and sisters in Christ and the Lord, if you start at the bottom there, a Christian, a, a person professes their faith in Jesus. They become a Christian. They call upon the Lord to forgive them and save them. That we go in, in different directions in life and are living. And in the one day, in the same day, the same person could go and following those three arrows within a few moments of each other. We're so muddled up. We may head off to the right there with legalism and obeying a whole load of man-made rules. Now I'm saying man-made in contrast to God's laws. So all these man-made laws that people add on and, and, and want to control the way we think and, and act and a whole legalistic outlook. And that's not the Lord's way. There's no love there. Or we may go in the opposite extreme and, and think we have a license now to sin. It doesn't matter what we do because we're forgiven and we're saved and, and we're free now and we can do whatever we like and a licentious attitude. And, and that's not love for Christ. That, that, that's ruination to us. But we're all in danger of going in these wrong directions. But the right direction for the Christian is the way of love. The love that flows from our master Jesus to us and that we, we return and we, we love him because he first loved us. And we want to obey him out of love. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. <coughs> if you love me, you'll obey my commands. A new commandment he gave us that we love one another. And the other ten commandments are still there. And those great commandments, God's summary of truth revealing his character and his will. Now some will say to us, only nine of those apply today. The, the Lord's day, that commandment, the, the Sabbath, that's past, that doesn't apply. Now, Jesus never said it didn't apply. He showed us how to live it. He showed us how to live it. The Lord's day is precious. It's a precious day. And when the world sees the people of the Lord delight in the Lord's day. Notice that, that title, Lord's day. That's a New Testament title. It's echoing in the Old Testament Sabbath. Isaiah 58 God says there will be blessing for the church when God's people delight in his day because they delight in him. And so your freedom, you may say, as a freedom as a Christian, I can do this, that, or the other in the Lord's day. I'm not bound by man-made laws. But you think of the Lord's day and the fourth commandment and the great principles that are there. And the shorter catechism, by the way, and, and what's, what's permissible to do Works of mercy and necessity is still as good a summary as you'll ever find. Works of mercy. Jesus telling people to lift somebody out of a hole if they're stuck in it. Don't be leaving it to the next day. Mercy, mercy. And works of necessity. And these two great statements sum up a lot. But you might say, well, I can go here, there, or the other on the Lord's day. I'm free to do that. And yes, you'll make your decisions as a Christian as to what we do. But for me, I'll choose not to go a whole lot of directions in the Lord's day. I don't generally think I need to be in shops on the Lord's day because there are six other days and I'm not that fussed in shopping. And those days in the Lord's day is for something better, for the Lord. I don't make habit of going to, to eat out in the Lord's day. That's not for me. It's, it's the Lord's day. Because when I go to those places, and I've been there over the years in family events, it's a bit like the family events in the places of idol worship that Paul was writing. When I go there, what, what do I see? Years ago, I used to go and see young people there working, not able to be at church because they were there to prepare a meal for me to sit and eat. And my conscience is troubled. And I'm longing that these young people wouldn't need to be there and they'd be able to be at church and have a desire to be at the place of worship. And so you need to weigh these things up. 
and you make your decisions and I'll make mine and we answer to God. But the Lord's day is precious. It's precious because the Lord's precious. And you'll find evangelical Christians with all sorts of different attitudes in this matter. You'll find Presbyterian ministers with all sorts of different attitudes in this matter. But if you're bringing somebody else whose conscience is troubled, maybe you're free to do as you like in that regard, or you think you are, and, and you haven't really thought through the commandment, and you're free to do, and you're bringing someone else with you, and in their conscience they're not quite sure they should be there. Don't coerce them to be there because if you do, you're causing them to sin because when they go against conscience, they sin against God. They sin against God. And that's the, that's the implication, the outworking of what's going on in 1 Corinthians 8. It would be strange for us to, to go to a whole lot of places where people have to work on the Lord's day to, to entertain us when we wouldn't want to work in those places ourselves on the Lord's day, wouldn't it? It would be a double standard. And so we weigh all these things up and we reason it through. And out of love for Christ and his people, we make decisions as to how we live. Because we want to live to please him. Because he loves us so. It's out of love now. Not legalism, but out of love. We want to love the one who loved us and gave himself for us. We're going to sing in closing, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
me the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all evermore. Amen.